Marx was indeed right. The base does indeed inform the superstructure. Like this, this crab bucket mentality of neoliberalism, where everyone only ever cares about themselves, has destroyed the fabric of our society from from the ground in history as a a country on the brink of collapse. Ever used huge amounts of public money for huge amounts of spectacle to cover up the fact that the country was on the brink of collapse. That's never been a thing that's ever ever happened. How about, Oliver, how about? This is a Dickensian dystopia. How about people are literally dying? We do have, more, there are more homeless people in London than there are people in Norwich. They're just, they're just lackeys. They're lackeys for the bourgeois. They're lackey for, you know, the ruling class. And they have never, ever been curious. They've never, ever been anyone who has any you know, interest in changing any of the status quo. They are the, they, they are just like the, the dog's bodies of the status quo. They're there to manufacture the consent of the people around them to maintain the status quo. They have no position of critique of the powers that be whatsoever. They don't ever you know, hold power to account at all. Britain is a, a remarkable country, remarkable, because it gave rise basically to the world's first nationalism, um, but it's at the same time tied up with an empire that no longer exists and a set of feudal institutions like like the crown and yet we're in the 21st century pretending that well, look at look at this shit look at this shit people are saying gutted for any britons to feel duty bound to distance themselves from this unbelievable spectacle due to their politics the profession is just epic nobody does it better no it's psychotic i'm not distant i'm not i'm not i don't feel duty bound to distance myself from the spectacle i think this i think this spectacle is just like like it's almost metaphysically bad right it's almost just kind of morally Bad. In the same way that you, we, we all understand the value of all the money that went into this, right? So we, again, we know how that translates into money for other things that could be used to make this country better. This does not make the country better, right? There was an article by Andrew Neil. Let me let me find it. Oh, this week has proved that Britain isn't a declining power. Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't, Andrew. I'm sure that a country going through a huge cost of living crisis with huge swathes of inequality will come to that one later, where every, the, the society itself is falling apart. People, we're ne more divided than we've ever been. People utterly hate each other. People have had their manufactured consent so that they don't even think about their own needs anymore to be cucked to things like the monarchy and the bourgeois at this point. And, the, and we are on the brink of economic collapse at the same time. But we have loads of money to spend on you know, pomp and pageantry to celebrate an unelected monarch dying. Yeah, because it's like never in history as a, a country on the brink of collapse ever used huge amounts of public money for huge amounts of spectacle to cover up the fact that the country was on the brink of collapse. That's never been a thing that's ever, ever happened, right? And then the fact that these people, this Jonathan Shallot person says that, that the elites wallow in running us down. It's the queen! She she was the elites. The royal family are the and the aristocracy are the elites. The bourgeois are the elites. I I just I cannot understand these people. The fact that you know whilst the actual elites, the bourgeois, are you know, swimming in cash more than they've ever had, as Mick Lynch, why the the rich have never been richer. We have more billionaires than we've ever had. These are the actual elites. They're they're loving this. Because they understand that people will ignore the fact that their material conditions are getting ever steadily worse while the rich is getting better. The normal people will suddenly forget all of that. So much so that the BBC even said that, well, the cost of living crisis is now something that's completely, you know, uh, you're overshadowed by the death of the Queen. I'm like, like, the Queen won't put food on my table. What the fuck are you talking about? It's normal. It's not. It wasn't normal 200 years ago. It certainly isn't normal now. And, and that contradiction really highlights that. Um, yeah, I mean, I found this actually what, what, more, more to the point. Uh, the New York Times did a article uh, which is looking at basically fleshing out that guy's claims uh, in, in, a, in a journalistic way. Um, it set off not just you'd expect kind of right wing commentators, but kind of centrist commentators who went into, I'd say, near hysteria. Um, about the New York Times and how offended they it's just It's just so upsetting. It's just, why would you say this? Right? We hate you. And they all can stop canceling their subscriptions um, and all the rest of it. And I just find it a really interesting insight into how sort of journalists see their position in terms of, you know, they're literally personally, it's like you, you've insulted their mother. That's how they were behaving. Like the New York Times had done a hatchet job on their mothers um, when they're actually, it's just talking like, about. There's, there's an article that we're going to go over. Like, let's go, fuck it, let's go over it now, right? In, so in response to this kind of New York Times stuff, the journalist sphere in the UK, they absolutely lost their tiny minds. Their minds got blown. They, they, they're so wedded to the idea of, again, Great Britain, quote unquote. It's, again, it's almost feels like that they still wish that they lived within the empire. 
They and they feel like any slight upon the country, uh, but for anything they've ever done wrong, you know, by reporting on I don't know things like basic facts, is somehow you know, derogatory towards the empire that they've clearly mentally connected themselves to, right? Like, let me find some of these bits and pieces people were saying at the time. Yeah, the Queen Elizabeth II's funeral, which will involve elaborate processions, vigils and rituals, will be paid for by British taxpayers as they deal with soaring energy prices and high inflation. The British government has not yet said how much it will cost. A fact. Something incredibly reasonable for them to be able to create an article out of or to create a story out of. Uh, and I, I just like the person from that clip, they will 100% agree with that framing in that it is ridiculous that, we, that the taxpayer has to pick up the bill for this shit. When there was plenty, when that money could have been used for better things that we just don't do, right? And yet, Tom Harwood in the response goes that the British government just committed north of 100 billion to help with cost of living, which is just going to go to you know, to line the pockets of the shareholders of the energy companies that are fleecing us that would have otherwise been fleecing us in the first place, right? She's using public money to then just bail out a bunch of energy companies. That's not helping with the cost of living. That's just making sure the country doesn't collapse whilst also protecting the profits of billionaires. Because she's not taxed any of these fucking energy companies with windfall taxes. She just used additional borrowing, right? You absolute ghouls for pointing out incredibly basic facts. Other incredible responses. Let me let me find some other ones. Again, I have to wait for Twitter to load, unfortunately. Total cost of the state funeral for head of state will pay into the amount the US taxpayers will pay for President Biden to attend it. Flying motorcades, Air Force One, helicopters, and 400 Secret Service agents across the Atlantic and back isn't cheap. First of all, I also agree that it's silly to spend this much money on stuff for the American president when people in America are also sleeping rough, are also going hungry, also can't afford the rent, also can't afford the bills, right? It is also ridiculous. Just because you understand that that's ridiculous doesn't then... Why do you, can you not apply that same logic to the fact that the New York Times is correct in this instance. That's, yeah, both, at least with President Biden, right? At least President Biden actually does something, even if lots of it is bad. At least he actually maintains his position for some kind of utilitarian basis, because there needs to be a head, of, like, an elected head of state who has things that they can do to be able to influence policy, because they've been elected on that mandate, right? He is an elected official who can use his power to be able to, you know, fulfil the electoral mandate that he's been given during the presidential election. That's a thing that he can do. And then, by if he was to, you know, somehow die, I don't know, hence why he would need Air Force One, etc. That would that would do him more harm than if one of the royal family randomly died, right? They clear like clearly these costs are at least somewhat justifiable. Even if I hate Joe Biden, at least there's a, some kind of justification to spending that money uh, on President Biden's, you know protection or whatever to be able to get him there to the state funeral the state funeral if that wasn't happening the u.s president wouldn't have to pay that money either and the queen does nothing let's have a look at another one here journalists are in global embarrassment apparently for reporting basic facts just telling the truth apparently but i guess to be fair he's from he's from guido forks so the truth is probably something that he has a pretty rocky relationship with I don't, Oliver Cam here, the agroist of, agrocent, of agrocentrists, writer for the Times, of course. I don't know why you pursue this vendetta, but I wrote about it last week. For what it's worth, I'm a liberal and an Atlanticist, and you've published me. And I'm baffled by a promotion of sectarian non-entities in order to depict this country as a Dickensian dystopia. How about... How about... Oliver? How about... This is a Dickensian dystopia. How about people are literally dying? We do have, more, there are more homeless people in London than there are people in Norwich. That's how many homeless people there are in London. We could fix that overnight by spending the money to do so. But no, our state would rather spend all of that money on the on the ceremony of a state funeral of a monarch who, I, who knew a large portion of the country could not give a shit about. And the people who do give a shit about have mental health issues, right? I'm sorry, they, they, these people are just... These people are just completely demented if they care this much to spend taxpayers' money on this shit. And then also, as I spent in a, I mean, it mentioned in a, a clip I put as a short on, on YouTube, we might even go into a recession because of this. Because all economic activity has to get suspended today, right? Apart from clearly Twitch streamers, the, the backbone of the modern industrialised economy. Because of the entire economy is getting shut down, we might get pushed into a recession for all of the time that's been taken off and all of the new economic activity that's been halted to do with all of the stuff to do with the Queen's death, right? They they then they literally think that this is his article saying that the New York Times has a vendetta against Britain. 
They just cannot. They cannot possibly. They're in such a tiny little journalist posh posh boys club private school bubble, right? Where they can't even possibly comprehend the idea that Britain is failing right now. They think they can't even see that it's bad. They've never lived on the breadline. They've never lived at the bottom of the society where the rest of us have to fucking fester, right? So they can't even they can't even possibly contemplate the idea of the UK doing anything bad ever or being somewhere that isn't just <laughs> green fielded type stone wall nice little idyllic paradise that they seem to believe that it is when it's actually we we are pathetic, right? As I'll go over and later, we're the most unequal, one of the most unequal countries in Europe, right? On par with the United States as to how many, as to the difference in um, wealth between the poor and the rich. We do worse than Slovenia at this shit. There are people, there's people out there, you, we have people in work, in who work in our health service, our national health service, which is dying right now, which is being deliberately killed by austerity through policies that have been passed by the government that's in charge deliberately so they can privatise it to sell to their mates, right? The nurses who work in who work in the NHS are having to use food banks, right? We have food banks inside call centres. Our country is falling apart. It's not a vendetta against Britain, Oliver Cam. When you report basic facts on the on the reality that this country is completely fucked, and everyone at the bottom of the of the food chain, we all know it. We all see it. We can all see it crumbling from amongst us. We see the social the, the deteriorating the kind of social fabric of our country be pulled apart by you know profit seeking monsters. Who have no, who do not care for the institutions of our country staying together. All they want is to make to make money out of the back of it, and that's been the continuous process for the last 40, 43 years of of neoliberal policy making. As I've said, Marx was indeed right. The base does indeed inform the superstructure, like this in, in mentality of neoliberalism, where everyone only ever cares about themselves, has destroyed the fabric of our society from from the ground up. From the people just have stopped being the kind of caring society that we used to have. And people like the New, the New York Times, they're right to criticise the UK. They're right to tell us that our country's shit, because it is. It's a mess. It's f***ed up. And I think, or Keith Starmer might come along and say, oh, I might come and, I might come and fix some things. But even though we look, we, we are, we're going to be facing down, as I'm going to discuss later, some horrendous policy platforms from Liz Truss. The establishment liberal media going, oh, without Labour looking forward to, you know, Truss implementing her king dystopian... Uh, you know, anarcho-capitalist policies moving on in future. I'm like, no, I'm not rubbing my hands with glee. No one's rubbing their hands with glee. This is going to send people into even worse poverty than they are. Liz Truss wants to turn us into the fat shop of Europe, right? They're already removing the working time directive so they can literally work us to fuck death. We, what, most of my generation are barely going to get any good pensions whatsoever. And we're going to have to retire in our 70s at this rate. And then just like, oh, well, Labour must be looking because they, they want to want to win the election. Well, tough. We don't have two years. We don't have two years to fix this shit as the country gets gutted from within by by the the kind of the klepto capitalists that Liz Truss is you know, willingly sucking the dicks off and licking the boots off. I, I honestly, like this country is completely fucked. Anyone who can't see it is completely blind, right? And so much so. But again, this is a different kind of different angle. Whereas Oliver Cam is just a liberal who thinks that that knew that Britain is just some kind of bastion of everything, all this good and true, and hates hearing any slight against it. Douglas Murray, in fact, th sees it as some kind of attack on the West, most likely, because obviously our favourite resident crypto fascist from the New York Times, Douglas Murray, New York Times on a jihad against UK and Queen Elizabeth. Good, this country, Queen Elizabeth, right? I'm sure she was nice and lovely and whatever. She sat around on a little throne with her jewel encrusted hat, being all fucking, you know, nice to her family or whatever. But the actual, the idea, right? The New York Times is criticizing the institution of the monarchy and the fact that the that the state funeral is costing so much money during a cost of living crisis. We're already borrowing huge amounts of money to be able to pay off the, the, the people who own the energy companies to continue making even more money out of the cost of living crisis, right? That is not the same as critiquing her specifically. That's a critique of the, the institution of the monarchy, right? But then again, everything has to be personalised in these people's minds. It cannot be an attack on a system or an institution. It has to be, you, you hate the Queen. Why do you hate the Queen, New York Times? It's nonsensical. Remember when people used to call the New York Times the paper record, how that has changed? Today, the, the paper doesn't inform its readers, readers, it preaches to them. What you mean like you're doing now, Douglas? All it was doing was making criticisms of a system that's failing. Good. It should do. People should be more critical. Like, understand that these are facts that these facts that you don't like, Douglas, but these facts do not care about your feelings, unfortunately.
This is what they've done in recent years about my own country of birth, Great Britain. The call seems to be that in 2016, the British public failed to take the advice of NYC and had to, the cheek to vote for Brexit. Since then, the paper has carried out a jihad against Britain. For six years, they've been running hit jobs on the country. Well, no, the country's just, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for loads of different myriad reasons, whether it be economically or, you know, even, like, I could even call this a kind of a spiritual failing of the UK, in such that the social fabric has been torn apart so much by horrendous policy um, that, you know, it's, I, I don't even believe in spirituality, but if there, if I did, I would feel like people's spirits had been crushed by the weight of how frack, how shit this country is. And, and to be fair, the problem is that 2016 is not the point at which things started going shit. Obviously, Brexit, you know, heightened a load of divisions, allowed for a bunch of kind of crypto fascists like this person to be able to seize that moment to be able to garner support. I'm not going to deny that, right? But this has been going on for a decade at the very least, if not for 43 years. This this continued decline has been happening over time, and it is the fault of neoliberal policymaking. Um, and the New York Times again are completely correct to criticise that. Just wish they did more criticism of of um <laughs> of the US in general. They've pretended that the British public still subsists on mutton and gruel. I mean, it's not really far off, is it, Douglas? But again, how would he know? He's a f you rich. Wow, what, what, how many times has he even stood near a poor person in his life? Probably never. They have claimed the country is a poverty-stricken wasteland, also true. And week after week, they have inevitably accused Britain of being racist, also true. Now, with the death of the Queen, the paper has stooped yet lower. It didn't even wait a few hours for it to run its first hit piece on the 96-year-old monarch. Since last week's news, there's been a daily diet of malcontents attacking the Queen for the empire, colonialism, and even slavery. Now the paper is moaning about the cost of the Queen's elaborate funeral. Good. And complaining that this is happening at a time of soaring energy prices and high inflation. True. Funny enough, that, I don't know why you're putting soaring energy prices and high inflation in fucking in quotes there, like as if that's somehow the opinion of New York Times and not basic facts. Funnily enough, the British people don't at all mind paying for a state funeral for a much-loved monarch who headed a massively popular and respected institution. I mean, does that make their criticism any less warranted? Just because the people like it because their consent's been, been manufactured, does that not mean? Does that not still warrant criticism about the money that could be spending meeting these people's material conditions? Like, maybe? I can't believe I'm having to be defending the New York Times here. It's another bourgeois newspaper, but at least they have the gall to, you know, present basic facts about the UK, warts and all, right? Yeah, 2008 financial crisis and the Tories and Brexit, they've all, they've all this kind of, there's all this kind of big confluence of things that were born out of the, the crisis the crisis of neoliberalism. You're absolutely right. A uh, woman equation. By comparison, I can't imagine who would even bother attending the ceremony if the old grey lady had passed on. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like, and the reason, there's another reason why the New York Times are getting hate from British journalists, right? There's another reason why they're getting a load of hate, but like, there's been, I don't know if anyone remembers the Trojan horse scandal, which is essentially a scandal that there was going to, there was some kind of, that there, there was a fake letter that was produced to insinuate there was going to be, there was some Muslim plot to infiltrate schools and turn people into, you know, Salafists or whatever. And that fake letter was taken as true and created prevent created a bunch of, you know, anti-Muslim hysteria in the UK. And it turns out to be completely fake. And all the journalists fell for it, right? All of the um all the politicians all fell for it. And the the consent about this was all manufactured to be able to hate Muslims specifically, right? Because it's the easy boogeyman to again to turn people away from their own material conditions, right? You're, it's very easy to use Muslims as a scapegoat for the rest of the problems that the country is already facing, uh, you know, economically and socially, etc. Things like that, right? It's very easy. They're very easy minority to blame. And this um, this up, up and coming journalist called Hamza Saeed did a podcast for the New York Times exposing the whole lie, exposing the fact that it was all a grift, exposing all the damage that was done, and the specific ways in which that this was used to. Um, denigrate the British society and, and use as a scapegoat to be able to attack Muslims, right? And the British press, they lost their tiny minds for two reasons. Actually, probably three reasons, actually. The first reason is because they want to be able to make loads of money off of the anti-Muslim hysteria because that's part of their job, right? So any of that being uncovered it is a direct threat to their own you know, future you new know, earnings potential, right? It's, it's, a, it's a bombshell story that they didn't get access to. Second of all, 
He's a journalist who's just come up the ranks, right? He's an up and coming journalist. He's not somebody who's part of the private school educated posh boys old club that is the UK journal, incestuous UK journalism industry, but they all just report on the same shit. They all share the same fucking ideology. They're all part of the same you know, coterie of people, right? I explained this on Twitter where the BBC, like everyone talks shit about them for being right wing on for current affairs output. But the case is, is that it's not really the fact that they're you new, know, they're being infiltrated by the state because they're the state broadcaster. The issue is, is that they could hire any UK journalist and they'd all report the same things in the same fashion in the same way with the same opinions because it's one big club, right? It's all a big club of people who just want to be able to continue churn out money for doing nothing um, because they all share this same ideology that no one ever wants to deviate from. And Hamza Saeed for the New York Times, he did that, right? He came up with the ranks, he wasn't part of that group, and he he went against the put this the you know the received wisdom of the ideological kind of groupthink of the UK media journalism sphere. And the third thing that he did was then attack that journalism sphere by saying, you should have seen this and you've not and used it for political gain and for personal and financial gain as well. Right. He attacked them for doing that. And suddenly they they lost their tiny little minds. Hamza Saeed, miraculous. They lost their tiny minds because they realised they'd been called out. They'd been called out for being the absolute sham that they are. But they aren't people who are genuinely curious, who want to critique the powers that be. They're just they're just lackeys. They're lackeys for the bourgeois. They're lackey for, you know, the ruling class. And they have never, ever been curious. They've never, ever been anyone who has any you know, interest in changing any of the status quo. They are the, they, they are just like the, the dog's bodies of the status quo. They're there to manufacture the consent of the people around them to maintain the status quo. They have no position of critique of the powers that be whatsoever. They don't ever you know, hold power to account at all. They are what power uses to maintain their power. They always have been. And that exposure, that exposure that Ham Society did of the British media and political class, right? That was sacrilege to them. That was sacrilege as far as they were concerned. And they turned on them like a dime, right? Sonia Soda, like, absolutely not. She, oh, I fucking hate Sonia Soda with a burning passion, right? But she, she, even her, from The Guardian, the supposed fucking progressive newspaper, even she went on the attack on Hamza Saeed for having the daring to be somebody of British, of British you know, ancestry who critiqued the UK journalism class for being the incestuous in, you know, internal club that they are in a paper that wasn't even UK based as well. The, the, the treachery, the theoretical treachery, right, that that entails, that he must have done in their eyes to then continue the kind of screed that we get from here from Douglas Murray about the New York Times for you know even insinuating that maybe Britain isn't just this glorious land that po once populated the world and civilised them all. Because that's how, that's how they think, right? It's this colonial mindset where they fundamentally believe in Britain being the greatest country in the world and the things that they did was to spread the, the ideology of Britain throughout the world through colonialism, right? And that's a fundamental belief that they have. I saw a tweet thread the other day where some some journalist was saying, "I can't imagine a world where it would be better had British Britain not been imperialist. Like there would have been no kind of you know equality for women in all these Commonwealth countries were it not for the British Empire." I'm like, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Was there ever any was there ever any kind of female equality in any of these countries before the socialist governments that came afterwards? It's like look at Afghanistan, even during the Republic of, of Afghanistan, right? Pre PDPA, but post um, the exit of of the UK of you know the British Crown from from Afghanistan, there were no women's rights. As soon as the communists take over, though, all of a sudden women's rights start happening. The same happened in Ethiopia as well, right? Like the idea that Britain spreads female emancipation to these countries when you know the the leftists in those countries are the ones who actually drove the female emancipation in the first place, right? It's completely nonsensical. It's that, that the, it, this is historical revisionism, explicitly to try and paint a rosy, have rose tinted spectacles, I guess, on the history of Britain and to what Britain actually stands for in the world. They cannot cope with the idea that Britain isn't just some kind of world superpower anymore, right? So that's a lot of them why they why these people did support Brexit specifically, not because of any particular economic bonus, or economic gains, or anything like that, or some kind of. They just wanted the prestige of being the island all over again. They they what they didn't they because they were part of the European Union. They felt it wasn't grandiose enough position for the UK to be in, despite being one of the most kind of influential members of the EU at that time. And they cannot cope with that shit. 
And that's why Douglas Murray, obviously, the, the, he's got this defence of the West, whatever, is the same shit that he's doing here with with the New York Times, because the New York Times have attacked Britain for being pathetic. Because we are, we just, this country is completely pathetic. It's absolutely, no, completely pathetic. Like, look here, look here. The New York Times hates this country for reasons best known to itself. Countless articles full of errors and bile. Once a great newspaper rendered itself a joke. Yeah, like, they just cannot deal with criticism of Britain as a country. The fear of a failing empire explains a lot about Britain. 100%. One, 100,000%. And you, it explains a lot about the, the, you know, the, um, the attitude of a lot of other people as well, right? Look at Turkey. Look at Erdogan, right? It's the kind of things that he's engaging in. Not entirely the per not entirely the actions of somebody who feels slighted by the falling of the Ottoman Empire. It's clearly has some kind of ties to that, you know, ideologically as well, by wanting to you know, talking wanting to conquer in into Syria and things like that. Like like the the loss of kind of world influence always scares people like that. And ironically was make Britain great again for very true, and all we've done is make things worse. And Putin wanted, Putin wanted to restore the Russian Empire, but exactly, all, and using the guise of the Soviet Union to do so because he knows he'll he'll anger people in the West if he does it through the lens of the Soviet Union rather than the lens of the Russian Empire, which really is what he actually is trying to do. Uh, and the Russian, because Russians actually have there's a really good Mia Malta video on this where they have this kind of alternative understanding of history a lot of people do in Russia, which is um, based around the fact they they do genuinely believe that the Russian people are somehow like. The God's chosen people, essentially, and that's why that Putin can use this line of thinking to be able to push people to to support the invasion and things like that. For all that's there's for all that there's plenty to dislike about the New York Times. I'm amazed at their ability to say things that are obviously true and correct about Britain, but plainly off limits in this country, sending the world's boldest men into repeated meltdowns. Because of course, there is an unspoken understanding, ideological understanding between the whole of the journalist class in this country, at least the the professional journalist commentary in this country. That Britain is part of that. Is Britain is still technically great when it's not, and a foreign paper, no less, diverging from the group thinks that they are accustomed to because they only ever all they do is just continue, you know, butt fuck each other in this little circle that they've got, this UK journalism circle, that they never they don't they they don't hear, they don't they don't understand or even recognise any criticism outside of their own little bubble. Simple. That's why we. That's why we. That's why we're left with this trust. Is because the only place that is that is these people are allowed to go is further right. Look at Corbyn, right? The only way that any of these things are allowed to function, any of these political institutions are allowed to function, is if they go further right. And that's why we've been landed with narco capitalists at the highest positions of government. It's just, I honestly. I, ju I just hate journalists. I have no other politics. I just hate them. I hate them so much. In fact, it's, ju it's just the, the kind of mind-bending cognitive distance where they genuinely believe that they are you know, holding powerful pe people's feet to the fire when literally they are just bootlickers. L little bootlickers who just want to be able to serve the class of people who pay their bills. And that's it, right? That's all they ever are. As, as Chomsky said, like if you believed anything else, they would not be sitting there. And speaking of which, if you did enjoy this content, future YouTube videos, please do consider liking and subscribing and clicking the bell, which will notify you when I go live. You can also subscribe on Twitch for £2.99 during September, or you can become a member on YouTube for all of 99p. If you're watching this and you want to become a member, it's 99p, you get emotes, just like you do on Twitch. So if you want to give me money, that's a thing that you can do. Um...